Um, hello, my name is Emily. I am the senior producer at Heart of Glass. Um, and a huge welcome from everybody at Heart of Glass. Um, we're really uh, pleased for you to join us today and to um, get to know the work of um, an amazing artist and writer, Marjorie H. Morgan. Um, I'm just going to very briefly um, point you to the Safer Spaces policy. So this um, is a part of all of our events and you will have received a link to the online version of that policy um, when you signed up to the event. That's just to um, make sure that we are all feeling safe and comfortable in this space. And if at any point you uh, want to raise anything, please let me know in the chat and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, if anything technical goes wrong, um, I will contact you via Eventbrite and we'll also let you know on Twitter how to rejoin or um, any kind of uh, technical information. Um, we are lucky enough and totally honoured to be in the presence of four incredible um, speakers today. So as I mentioned, um, we have Marjorie H. Morgan here to present um, a new work um, called The Talk, which was commissioned as part of our remote um, commissions programme at Heart of Glass. Um, this has been really special, um, once again, to be able to work with Marjorie, um, who we worked with previously um, through our homework commissions earlier uh, last year, um, and also as part of the With For About conference. Um, and I'd really recommend checking out Marjorie's um, earlier projects with us over on our website, as well as exploring her website, which um, contains an amazing amount of work and writing and blog posts and uh, my just social media as well is always a wealth of information and um, interesting conversations. So I'd really recommend that you check, check out all of those um, different platforms and uh, pieces of work. Um, it was very, uh, we're really pleased to have been able to uh, work with Marge on this particular commission. The, um, the remote commissions really were a chance for us at Heart of Glass to explore the fullness of the commissioning process and to offer um, support and resources to um, to artists to explore whatever it was that they wanted to explore and understanding that commissioning is is a long process and involves many different stages and so artists have taken that in lots of different directions whether that's um, time to research time to read time to talk to other artists or actually whether it's a moment to, to um, work on something that they maybe have wanted to work on for a long time. So we were really pleased that Marj Marjorie um, uh, accepted our invitation and has been working on the piece that you'll experience today. And I mentioned that we have four uh, great speakers with us today. So we also have um, Professor Patricia Daly, um, welcome, and Professor Jeff Palmer, welcome, as well as the Lord Mayor of Liverpool, who I am now going to um, hand over to. Um, to give um, an introduction. Thank you again for joining us and um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you and welcome everybody. It's an absolute honour and privilege to join uh, my good friend Marjorie Morgan today. Uh, Marjorie and I go back some way. Um, I, through my role as Mayor Lead for Equality, I was able to commission uh, some of Marjorie's early works, uh, The Morning Bride and also Home From Home, which concentrated on the Windrush uh, crimes and awareness around that. And I was able to uh, commission that and support that um, through the Mayor's Fund at Liverpool City Council. Marjorie plays an integral role in, our, in opening up the conversation around racial inequalities, uh, disparities, and general conversations around uh, change, ever-changing communities and how we find our place within this city. And, and the wider country. Uh, I believe that the work that Marjorie has been able to do has, has had an impact on education, uh, raising awareness, it has instigated some very, very difficult conversations um, that are now becoming part and parcel of everyday conversations. Uh, when she embarked on the work, um, you know, there was very little discussion taking place about uh, race inequalities in the city. And so she was at the forefront of a, a group of people who actually implemented change and how the city looks at race inequality in Liverpool and beyond. 
And so I don't want to say too much because Marjorie speaks for herself uh, by the work that she does. And I know that there's going to be some debate and discussion today uh, from all of the panel uh, that have joined today for the event. And I'd like to come in towards the end and just put some local context uh, in terms around uh, the race equality agenda for the city. And so without further ado, I'd just like to say thank you very much to Marjorie for inviting me to join you today and uh, take it away, Marge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, Lord Mayor. I appreciate um, all the panelists be, being here. Um, this work, I'll just do an introduction to the work and then after you've seen the actual short film, which is nine minutes long, then we'll, um, I'll introduce more in depth my uh, two panelists who are going, I'm going to have a conversation with, um, how I met them and why I've invited them. Um, but this particular piece, it's, it's like a, a short public service announcement type film. It gives an in, insight into the impact of, um, personal impact of racism on the lives of black young men. And as um, Anna's just said, it's supposed to stimulate discussion and to open up the way for uh, one of the things that both professors here um, talk about on a daily basis, education, and how we can uh, engage with other people to have a conversation. So um, yeah, hopefully at the end of this, even you know, if you've got any questions, sort of put them in the Q and A as we as we go along, and then we'll be able to get to them and discuss them during the conversation and afterwards um, when we uh, get together. All right, thank you. Remember who and whose you are. Yeah, I will. This is part one of the talk. Be a leader, not a follower. I know. This is not for my benefit. It's for you to keep you... Every day. From childhood until now, the same thing, the rules, over and over, drummed into my head, always behind closed doors. As a youth, I breathed their mantra and left it on the doorstep as I walked out into my life. Don't make police come out of this yard. Now make me have a left work to come out of school. Man, I know. That was a mistake. Raising my voice, lecture 4729 would be next. You're not the same as them. Don't let them fool you. I didn't raise you to be nobody's fool. More often than not, I have sense knocked back into me. Don't get in no mix-up, because you'll be the one to get in problems whether it's you or not, because you are the black one. It's not like that anymore. I try to tell them that my mates are blood brothers. Nothing will separate us. They didn't laugh much at things I said, but that always made them crease up. If you don't hear, you will feel. There are different rules. Remember, you know white. That's the start of lecture 1536, a firm favourite in our household. Breath, you're different. I don't see you as black. But I see them every day playing the race card to get out of their own trouble. I don't ever get to play the race card. Who controls the pack of race cards? Black people, of course. Or is it people of colour now? Or BAME minorities? That's what I mean. Minorities are all powerful then. Well, no. But still you, they, get advantages, if you know what I mean. Advantages? 
Let's come back to that one, okay? How about this? When was the last time someone who looked like you was told by their parents, you have to work twice as hard to get half as far as someone like me? That's just silly. This is a meritocracy. Everybody has a fair chance at progression in society. That's just willful ignorance talking. Let's talk about white privilege as friends. There's no such thing. I don't have any privileges for being white. You work hard, you get ahead. That's all there is to it. Anything else is... Is what? There's no point in discussing this. It always comes back to how hard life is because... Go on, say it, because I'm black. I don't see colour with you. I mean... Who are you? So why are you playing the race card? Playing the race card? For real? The go-to response in most races. You don't want to be called out on the racism. I see you, bruv. Nah, Brian, mate. What you have to understand is we don't live in the past. We live now. Everything we are right now is born out of the past. Both of us. Like we even think of ignoring it. Here's the problem with that. You have to let it go and just get on with life as it happens. Stop griping all the time. For God's sake, slavery is over. You need to let it go. Forget about it. We have. It serves no good purpose to talk about that sort of thing anymore. Life looks different to you. How so? Did you ever have the talk? Also known as living while black in a hostile environment. Of course not. Exactly. Answer me this. Why do you call me Brian? That's your name, fool. No, it's not. It's Bryden, Bryden, B-R-Y-D-E-N. It's been in my family for generations. You never said? I did. You said Brian was easier to remember. Sorry, bro, but everyone calls you that. Not my family, only outsiders. Are you calling me a racist? Bruv, you've more experience with being a racist than I ever could. Wait, wait. But I, sadly, have more lived experiences of racism than you could imagine. I'm not a racist. Okay, name me some classical composers. You mean like Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, Puccini, Salieri, and maybe Bach? How easy are they to say? Bryden's not quite like them, is it? Guess not, but... But they're white and European, right? What I need is for you to listen, not to explain my actual experience back to me through the prism of your whiteness. Bear in mind that may also include the intersectionality of class and social inequalities as well. And here I was thinking we were friends. Instead, I'm getting a lecture. Friends know and understand each other. You don't know me. Acquaintances, on the other hand. Brutal. You lot are always in the news for something, no? You never see the likes of me on TV or anything. You can have it. Oh, the multiple stop and searches. The... Here's the package, comment, when I'm there for an interview, not as a delivery man. They're not bothering to learn my name properly. Come on, man, I didn't know. The sexualization and criminalization of my blackness all in the same glance. It's tiring. Look, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. What can I do? 
Educate yourself. Do the work. Remember, we all live the consequences of our history. Because I have a dream. That my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Well... Thank you um, for be, being here and for sharing that with me. The, the reason why I did that, not, I will, I'll just read you a part of um, my reasoning behind it. I know that um, Emily has shared this, but when I received the, the commission, I... I, just, I was thinking, you know, we do in the end of 2020, and this is what's on the heart of glass sight. The past year has been like no other time in living memory. Everybody is tired, tired of the pandemic, tired of lockdowns, tired of news punctuated by deaths. The global population has been forced to watch the world as it was known at the start of 2019 shut down before the year was even closed. We thought that we were going into 2020 is, you know, a time of renewed vision. You know, everybody was talking about 2020. Um, but COVID came, you know, and um, this uninvited house guest made everybody lock down and the world turned inwards and started to look outwards at systems of inequality that were exasperated by the indiscriminate hand of the pandemic virus. And all these long-term viruses of planned, um, poverty, structural work and educational discrimination and institutional racism came to a boiling point with the public murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis on the 25th of May, 2020. The world reacted and this is part of my reaction to this. And it's the reason why I've um, asked um, the, the particular guest here to speak today. Uh, I'll do a brief introduction to Professor Daly and Professor Palmer um, and I'll, then I'll uh, ask them to discuss some of the points that were raised in the piece. And Professor Daly I've known um, since about half of my life really. Um, first met Professor Daly back in the 1990s and I was privileged to work with her in Oxford. Professor Daly is the first black female don to uh, get a position at Oxford University. Um, and it was during my time as a research assistant with Professor Daly um, that I, I started learning about, you know, I started thinking, why is she the only one? Yeah, and I, you know, through her guidance, I started doing more personal research, and that's when I found out about Professor Palmer. Uh, so it, Professor Daly led me to Professor Palmer, who, uh, although I've um, sort of not known him or as as long as Professor Daly, I got to know him through through my work and we met first in 2018 and we've become firm friends now I even call him Uncle Godfrey because <laughs> that's what you do <laughs> you know, when when you're in um, this kind of environment so um, but Professor Daly uh, helped me with so many things with due diligence and guidance she helped me to get accepted for my DPhil at Oxford Uni as well. And it's about 
once the door is open for you, you help others to get through that door as well. You don't pull up the ladder. Um, and that's what, what I want this environment to be about, for, for a, a conversation to talk about the themes and to share the knowledge that you have um, with others. So you've just, um, we've, we've had a couple of comments come through, but I'd, I'd like to ask Professor Daly and Professor um, Palmer to give me your reactions to the film. Okay. Professor, um, Professor Palmer. Daly can start, please. Okay, uh, I'll I'll start. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thank you. Uh, obviously, we've got some really serious people here, the Lord Mayor and the Rotary. <laughs> so pleased to meet you. And Jeffrey Palmer, who I've heard so much about, but I've never had um, a chance to meet, not even online. So I'm really pleased to be here. Um, it's a shame that we have to meet uh, when we're discussing such um, a really, what I found to be a very uh, emotional, actually quite emotional um, topic and I found the film I have to say well Drew when I watched it first I got very emotional I had to stop it part of the way mm -hmm. and it started for I suppose for people who don't live the black experience it might be new but when it first started it was so familiar you know um, it was you know you could have been my mother <laughs> talking to my brothers or to us you know, you could, um, and you could have been me talking to my son, you know, later on, once he got into his teens. And so there are some of those statements. I mean, I, can, I suppose for black, the black community, we could call them cliches mm -hmm. because we, we, you know, we hear them so often and yet we still have to repeat them. And I think for me, that's what was so tragic and what, why I became emotional because I had to do the talk with my son and I didn't want to do it, right? Because he's in Oxford, he's, 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 he grew up in a sort of middle-class environment. And, um, there, and I, you know, I'll be frank, there weren't that many black children in the school. A lot of his friends were white. And yet I had to take him away and say, look, your, you know, your, your experience going through life is going to be very different. And these are some of the things that you have to be aware of. And, um, I, you know, it's a difficult thing to do for a parent, but it has become part of the black tradition, you know, and I, I, I hope, I, you know, I want to, I suppose my, my uh, aspiration would be, we would, would be that we get to a time when black parents don't have to give the talk. Right? I mean, I can go on, but I'm not sure how much time I have. So let me stop there and then I can come no, back and say we'll, something. We'll come back to you, but, but that's, yeah. that's, that's quite important because um, the question that I asked myself when I was creating this piece is, um, why do we have to do the talk? Um, who, what black person do I know that hasn't, either as Patricia said, experienced the talk themselves or given the talk? Professor Palmer, have you um, have you had any personal experience of um, having the talk or giving the talk yourself? Well, well, yes. I mean, I, um, you know, you're you're absolutely right in a sense that what we have is an ignorance about people. It, it's an ignorance which is then um, a sort of um, is replaced with a whole load of prejudgment, mm. you know, and, and, and that's it, you know, you don't know, so you make it up. <laughs> and, 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 and therefore, what do you make up? You make up a story about um, to deny rights, to say you're always playing the race card, you know, and that's supposed to stop you trying to access your rights. <laughs> it, it, it is, you know, the other one is that, you know, you're always, you know, um, griping, you know, stop griping. That means you're complaining. You're trying to get something um, which you're not entitled to. And therefore all of these um, little sort of um, phrases are extremely important because they are denying right without, not based on any evidence whatsoever. 
And, and thus, um, when that is the case, it's extremely difficult to deal with. <laughs> because if you, all you can say, I'm not playing the race card. <laughs> and, and, and therefore, you, you then have this um, stalemate where there is no progress, no progress whatsoever. And what you, you then have, and all this is caused by, you know, and I can go back and you may say, when did this start? Mm -hmm. And I can say, I'm going to give you a date. This started in 1753 with one of the greatest so-called minds, you know, David Hume, the mm -hmm. philosopher. And he got up one morning in 1753 and said, in his view, the Negroes are inferior to whites. Believe you me, that's a statement by so, a great mind. So this one man said, um, you know, that there is an inferiority, but yeah. how, how did people buy into that? And why, why are we where we yeah. are today? Well, because when he said it, you know, it was during the enlightenment and he's the great mind. So nobody questioned it. You know, one or two people tried. And when somebody pointed out to Hume that there are black people with great capacities, you know, of, of intellect. And he said they were parrots. That means they didn't have the capacity to think. And believe you me, that's the basis of race. Because a few years later, in the seventh, late 1700s, Kant, the philosopher, picked that up and turned it into race, linking color with this lack of capacity. And that was used to drive slavery. So the, the, the individuals who are saying, race card, stop griping, slavery is over. The point is that they have derived their prejudicial views from two men who are regarded as two of the greatest minds. And that's what makes it difficult because just now the University of Edinburgh has taken down David Hume's name from a tower. And you cannot believe the protest from the intelligentsia saying that that's wrong. What do you think you're doing? This is a man that has probably killed more people with that statement. And we're fighting over it, I'm being attacked because I'm saying David Hume was no intellect. How can a man of reason use that kind of prejudice by saying without any evidence that black people are inferior? And therefore, what you've encapsulated, it, uh, and, and you use the word consequences. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've said in the past, we cannot change the past, but we can change the consequences, such as racism for the better. And what you've encapsulated and what people should take note of, that you have actually highlighting the end result of prejudice. <laughs> the end result of prejudice and is how are we going to change this? Yeah. How are we going to change it? And what you're saying is pointing out how ridiculous it is. Sometimes you can use ridicule mm -hmm. in order to get rid of something which people um, believe is, is, is true. So, what you're, whereas you're saying, education, that's how we've got to get rid of this ridiculous prejudice, which in fact, as you've also said, caused the death of George Floyd. He wasn't murdered, he was crucified. Um, it's the law killing somebody. Well, you, you say crucified and that people may um, take, we'll come to Professor Daly in, in a second, but you say crucified there, um, Professor Palmer. Yeah. Don't you think that was a bit strong? Wasn't it? Wasn't he just somebody who was in the wrong place at the wrong time? No, I, I think that the reason why we're talking, I'm talking to you today, is because of that death. It is the world seeing Hume and Kant for the first time, where a white man was a, 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 the law. It was like the Romans. That was the law killing somebody over nearly nine minutes and believe it was no big deal because he's only doing what white people think. 
Okay, Professor Daly's <laughs> not in there. Would you, would you like to come in with some comments? Then? Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand, Jack, what you mean by ignorance, but I don't think it's ignorance. We could say it's informed ignorance because there is a body of knowledge because it's pseudoscience, exactly what you've described, really, with Hume and Kant, whereby people that, you know, there are people who produce this information. We talk about, it's misinformation, really. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. have to look at the purposes. <laughs> why, you know, what were the reasons, the rationales for the promotion of this misinformation? And why does it persist? Yeah, And even before um, Hume, you know, I mean, the, the uh, Europeans, I, you know, I'm just writing a lecture on settler colonialism and, um, you know, and what's interesting, even before Hume, people were already, um, there were attempts to depict non-European people as uh, in a dehumanizing way. And um, there's a, a lot of research has done, has been done to show the link between this dehumanization and um, slavery, the need for, uh, you know, to find cheap, unfree labor to uh, generate wealth in the Caribbean. That wealth, which was then reinvested back in, in Britain and other European countries. So it's not, and, and we see this information or what we call disinformation, you know, perpet being perpetuated throughout the centuries hasn't disappeared. We still get reports that suggest that we are more, that criminalize us. Right. I mean, the police was an institution, certainly in the colonies, to protect the state from the people. It wasn't an institution. So was the military. <laughs> the, the, you know, colonial militaries weren't about fighting wars, you know, except perhaps during the First or Second World War. But most of the time, they were to protect the colonial state from the citizens or the people who live in the territory, right, that, who have been dispossessed. And so the police really, um, and especially in colonized territory still, in, in settler colonial uh, uh, places, countries such as the United States, um, the police was never there to protect the people, or, or certainly black people. When you know, when it was never there to protect them. And what we are seeing is what there's a, an American author called Christina Sharp, and she talks about the uh, the wake, you know, and the afterlife of slavery. That slavery really hasn't gone away. Some of the dehumanizing practices that started with slavery has continued through into the present day. Right? And we, you know, it's justified through the criminalization of black people so that uh, the exclusion of us from certain spaces because we might have criminal intent and so on. There are various ways through which um, that, that information feeds through, right? Um, and we might call it stereotypes or whatever, but they have, you know, they have resonance in, in, in the population. And they seem to have become, I think, more prevalent over the last few years um, as we see the rise of nationalism in, in certain European countries, certainly in this country, and Trump's, and Trump's nationalism in the United States. Mm -hmm. how, how is the concept of um, white spaces, how is that, um, how does that perpetuate racism? Well, because it's about exclusion. It's about who has the right to be in a particular space, um, who has the right to move, who, and then who has the right to govern, who is, you know, is in a particular space. And if we look at, I mean, I'm interested in migration, and if we look at migration, um, black, you know, black people have never had the right to be in any places. You know, we've, we've always been restricted. We've moved, you know, and when we've been moved, it's been forced, there's been forced migration. Some of us have moved, we can call it voluntary, voluntary migration, but some of the times, you know, we were forced out of the Caribbean also because there was unemployment, serious unemployment, destitution. People had to get out to find work elsewhere, right? So, but we've, you know, just existing in a place and feeling comfortable in that place, a sense of belonging is something that we've been stripped of since we um, left Africa. Right. Uh, with with the the concept of um, forced migration from the from the Caribbean, um, one thing that often gets me is when we when we talk about that we talk about um, going to the mother country, and I, I've written about this in in different forms in poetry and um, in both in prose, but uh, I'd like to discuss how the mother country 
has treated its children. Because, because as far as I know, um, mothers that I know don't treat their children the way people from the Caribbean have been treated when they arrive. Um, Jeff, um, mm -hmm. Uncle Godfrey, could you, could you tell me about your experience when you first arrived, especially relating to education and how you were categorised? You know, I... Okay, yeah, in fact, I came to this country in 1955. Um, probably before a lot of the people on our this gathering were, <laughs> you know, were born, <laughs> or they were quite young. But, and I came when I was 14 years and 11 months, and I'm speaking to you today because of that one month, because my mother did not realise I couldn't leave school before 15. So it's a sort of a mistake which she um, uh, uh, complained about all her life that you know I, I didn't go to work immediately when I arrived. <laughs> But again, this is our history. I didn't have the fortune in Jamaica, whereas a lot of other black people did, or mixed race people. I was brought up in a part of Kingston where people, you know, you didn't live very long because of the nature of the society we lived in. So that's post-slavery. You know, my father left when I was, was about seven and that wasn't unusual. Uh, so we have to live a lifestyle as a consequence of that slavery, there are other lifestyles, but this was mine and it wasn't uncommon. So when I arrived at Liverpool in 1955 and I didn't know how to get to Paddington and my mom was waiting for me in Paddington, as I said, I had to go back to school for that one month. And when I, my mother took me to the first school, I was designated educationally subnormal, you know, because I was asked somewhere like, where was Big Ben? What the hell should I know? <laughs> so I just arrived in the country. And that's what I meant, meant by, you know, prejudgment, where in fact, in the 1950s and 1960s, there were psychologists all over the, the Western world. And we've had it with the Watson of the DNA. And that's not long ago where people are still trying to prove Hume, that black people are inferior intellectually. So it is not a myth that we should forget. That's the basis of it. And what we are, the people were trying to do in the 60s, I think, was to de de devise um, psychology tests, which I was subjected to, and which I came out to being ESN, and a lot of black kids were designated that in the 50s and 60s. So we still have the same justification for enslavement that you were, you know, so intellectually subnormal. The same thing in the 60s that you were intellectually subnormal and therefore you should run buses and, you know, and, 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 and run the railways. But, and even today, uh, only a couple of weeks ago, I wrote a an article in a newspaper, and I pointed out, where are the black experts talking about COVID? You know, we, we, if we don't have that, the, the black expert talking about COVID, not just to black people, but to white people, mm -hmm. because he's an expert. And that's where we still are today, mm -hmm. that somehow we think black people are supposed to talk to black people. No, because knowledge is no color. Exactly. No Prof colour. Professor Daly, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, let me just say about the mother country. I think most people in the Caribbean, right, had a colonial education. And that colonial education was glorifying the British Empire, the British aristocracy, the Queen, and, uh, or the King Queen, and the, um, and the British Empire. So with that education, there's an assumption then that you're more familiar with Britain mm -hmm. you know, than you think, and that you're welcome, that you'll be welcome. You know, so it's almost as if you're going home to see for your with your own eyes what you studied, and to get that more that was um, pushed, that's pushed um, by through uh, the education, the colonial education system. And of course, when people come here, it's completely different. Their experiences even within the education system, right? And uh, I mean, I, one of the, I've just 
on a, I was in a chat yesterday or online discussion about um, some of the Caribbean leaders who came to Oxford and, and how alienating they found the place when they arrived because, and they had sort of the top, um, they went to sort of schools that were reserved or started out for um, the, the sons of sort of the planters, the white planters, the white merchants and so on. And then they, you know, which were which opened up in you know um, in the in the early twentieth century for you know I suppose it could be light skinned or mixed with mulattoes you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and they came they had like a sort of the education that was the equivalent of Eton or Harrow and they came to you know um, they came to Oxford and found it really difficult to to, to survive here so. And, and some some got dis disillusioned. Some left early. People like Stuart Hall, um, the sociologist, left uh, you know, <laughs> left without finishing his doctorate here, and so on. So so that 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 was a, that's a real issue uh, for for um, for many people here in terms of you know for how we see um, the you know uh, British education and the role that it plays within the colonies. And it's there's still a legacy, colonial legacy within. Within the, in not just in the Caribbean but in Africa as well and probably in India, whereby you know the, the, the aspects of the education system reflects you know is more attuned to the needs of a, a colonizing power than to that of a nation that's trying to build itself and to become independent. Um, with regards to uh, labeling as education is abnormal, I really liked what Jeff said about you know we were still seen as lacking capacity. Right, as lacking that intellectual capacity to progress, to, do, to take on advanced things. And I'll just give you one example of a um, recent one, really. Jeff mentioned COVID. And I think you, I don't know if you're aware that um, the UK Research Council, UKRI, um, put out a call for people to do research on the impact of COVID on um, BAME people, Black and Asian and ethnic minorities. I, I don't know how many applicants, applications they got. Because, um, I think there is a figure out there but none of the black applicants were funded, right? No. Um, and so there, of course there were black medical professionals, researchers, I even myself put in an application and I brought together six women, not just black, you know? I thought it was an amazing team that I put together of epidemiologists, um, sociologists, anthropologists to do this work. <laughs> it was an incredible team, you know, we had, uh, white British, we had Latin American, we had a Russian, we had various people, you know, with expertise. Um, and of course, the project wasn't funded. But and that's why, Jeff, we don't have because we don't get the money, we don't get the funding to do the research that will help us to raise our profile. And that's why we're not there, right? Um, and uh, and and it's a big problem. And of course, you know, people are protesting, um, especially the group of young researchers, black young black academics, is, is saying enough is enough. And they've, you know, they they complain to the research council, and the research council says it's looking into its policies. But yeah, that's how things change. I think what's happened is that the death of George Floyd has really forced a lot of institutions to actually address systemic racism within their yep. yeah. You know, the, the fact is that, I'll give you an example. Last year, I, I, I went to give a talk in Edinburgh and it was at the festival. And the interesting thing was that when I arrived, the young lady said, um, can I help? And I said, yeah. And she said, what do you want? I said, I've come to give a talk. And she said, what time? And I said, two o'clock. And she looked at the program and she said, two o'clock well, you can't be giving a talk then because that talk has been given by Professor Sir Jeff Palmer. The point is that I cannot be seen as Professor Sir Jeff Palmer. And therefore, what the, 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 the film, the video is about, and that's what I call it ignorance, you know, you could, as you say, informed ignorance. The point is that the schools don't teach it. Mm -hmm. And therefore people arrive through culture it is passed on through culture. The, the thing about black people, people don't even know the details. They've never heard of you or can. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they've heard of that black people are less able, will this, more prone to criminality, won't do this, 
and et cetera. And what we've got to do, the only point of a film like this or, or any of what we're trying to do is to try and change attitudes through our, our educational system to show that these things are not true, they're myths. Mm -hmm. They are prejudgment, which leads to discrimination. And therefore, we mustn't fudge the issue on it. That we must say, because the public who I've met, the local white people, et cetera, et cetera, said, we've got those views, but we didn't know where they came from. Mm. <laughs> and that, that's one of the, the sadnesses of this situation, because it's almost like it's inherited, racism is inherited, and people take it as part and parcel of their lives. Um, question that I'd like you um, both to answer is how uh, how do you think this statement is the truth or is it a lie that racism is a thief bearing in in mind the the um, number of black people who are um, excluded from things like educational advancement um, uh, general advancements within their, their careers and um, yeah how, how do, do you think this is true or do you think that it's, a, it's a fallacy that racism is a thief well should I take that yeah please okay yeah I think you know the the the, the thing I'm, I'm not very keen on when one use sort of analogies <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, because then people think it's a story. <laughs> the fact is what one could say is that um, racism has caused poor representation in our society. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has caused um, not just poor representation, it has um, created attitudes which have been dangerous for um, black people and for children. And therefore it, it is, if we, look at the, what racism has done, is that I also often say to people, as I give a talk, I said the person who could have, the descendant of the person who could have probably cured cancer, his ancestor, his ancestor died cutting sugar cane. Mm -hmm. The point is that human intelligence and the capacity we have destroyed a significant amount of it on the basis of a prejudice about skin color, because there is no evidence about differences in intelligence. And I was speaking to a company this morning and I pointed out to them, if you have a race strategy to get rid of racism in the company and improve representation or whatever, I said, what have you done? Having a race relation officer is not enough. Having an equality committee is not enough. You have to set yourself an outcome and then devise policies and strategies to arrive at that outcome. But, but what do you do um, with uh, people are too, they say they're too afraid to talk about racism. How do you approach that when people say, oh, I can't talk to my friends about racism. It's best to ignore it. Like um, in the film, the, Patricia, yeah. Carry on. Sorry, <laughs> you can carry on. No, I, I, I think part of the problem is that racism is seen as an individual thing, um, as a personal, uh, uh, you know, uh, attitude. It's that a personal attitude, and it is to some extent. But individuals are not responsible for racism, and I tend to use the, the I use this definition right, for racism. It's by an American African American um, geographer actually called Root. Wilson Gilmore, and she says she defines racism as state-sanctioned or extra-legal production of exploitation and group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death, right? Mm. So it's uh, the state sanctions us, makes us vulnerable, right? You know, um, to premature death. And that can come from, you know, um, it happened in relation to slavery, it happens in denial of rights. It can happen in terms of the institutions that exist that punish us, that take meter out in extreme violence against us without any repercussions, as sometimes the police will do. Uh, you know, um, it happens in you know in terms of denying our intellectual capacity. And one of the things, right, 
which people said about racism is that, it, I mean, a, a lot of, um, you know, medical scientists now, medicine um, scientists in particular, psychologists are looking at the impact of racism on, on our health, those unseen, on invisible impacts, right? So even though we think we are progressing, we're, you know, comfortable, those microaggressions, those daily racism actually gnaws away at us until we are much, we might look younger because some people say, you hear people say really? black people don't crack, skin don't crack, black people don't crack, but that, actually we do. We're cracking inside. Apparently we are older than white people, even though we might look younger. We age faster because of racism, right? Especially yeah. in, in countries like, so this is an issue that I think we need to, you know, we need to address. And it's not, so individual people, I, I won't, you know, I tell people that we, is that that structural racism is a systemic racism. Once we address those, right, then it's possible. Right? And we can address those through the education system. Yeah. Right? Then that will change individual views. Right? So I don't want people to feel that they, yeah, there's certain insults and slurs. You're not gonna swear at people. You, you know, um, you're not going to, you know, it's not um, ethical um, behavior to go around swearing at people. So why should you call me racial, <laughs> you know, racist uh, names? Right? That's how I see it. There's some things, insults or things that people have learned, which is not, you know, you don't say it, and you, you should be cautious about saying. Right? And so you shouldn't say those. But beyond that, I want to talk to people about what we can do to change institutions, right? Um, in order to make a difference so that that filters down the society into the society and will change individual views and attitudes. I, I agree with that totally. And that's one of the reasons why I think, um, uh, I know um, Uncle Godfrey doesn't like the, the, the racism is a, th is a thief analogy, but it's because it steals so much from people, so much of life expectancy, life mm -hmm. achievement. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the reason why I, I sort of look at it in those simplistic terms. Um, mm. are you gonna come in no, no, I agree with that. I mean, I don't, I don't say that the, the thing, the, the analogy may not be, be right. That I'm just saying that with analogies, people think, well, it's not real. We've got mm. facts to say that what does racism do? Mm. It, it stops people getting jobs. It stops representation. Mm -hmm. it, it does all those things. And the trouble is with, with the people in, 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 in your, the video who say you're playing the race card, mm. you're, you're stop griping, you know, slavery is over. But the point is we've got to address that. It's dead easy. Um, I'm not griping because slavery, the average lifespan of a slave was seven years. Mm. There was no education. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the people were taken away from their culture, their language changed. That's why I speak English. The, the fact is that there is enough reality, you know, to, and if we're going to change attitudes of the person says, don't play the race card, you've got to then give him or educate him in a way that that statement becomes nonsense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we're, we're um if we think of that and we're in the 21st century now people say okay that's all over slavery is over just forget about it mm -hmm. you know we live in a meritocracy how do you answer that consequences one word yeah. the historians have said that you have this this house is full of books by historians and whatever and what they've done quite cunningly is to say exactly that that's the past that's, we can't compare it with today. Mm -hmm. And this is so-and-so. And I usually point out, I said, uh, you know, the 10 commandments is the past, do we should get rid of them? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm dead serious. And therefore what we're talking about are consequences mm -hmm. of that slavery. Mm -hmm. the, the prejudices produced, the lack of infrastructure that, it, it, that, that Caribbean islands don't have, mm -hmm. the enormous amount of money that was slavery, the slave trade wasn't abolished because of the money. They couldn't afford to lose it. Mm -hmm. And for example, I'm arguing with somebody and what I'm gonna to say to your audience now, why this history is so critical. I can say to your audience, have you heard of William Wilberforce? Probably most people will not. Yeah. I will now say, have you heard of Henry Dundas? And you'll probably say no. 
you you probably know. Yeah, I, d I do. But please, can you share a bit about that? Because um, part of the um, film, there was a statue of um, Edward Colston in, and right. they're aware that the, the statue of Edward Colston was pulled down in Bristol. But right. Could you um, talk to us a, a, li a little about Henry Dundas? The work I'm doing. OK, um, thanks very much, Marge. The, the interesting point I was trying to make there is to show how people, or we believe we understand our history and we know people are saying, but we abolish slavery, etc. I'm now posing that question and I'll speak about Dundas. Is you've heard of Wilberforce, but if you haven't heard of Henry Dundas, then you know nothing about Wilberforce. You could almost say you don't know him. You don't know anything about Wilberforce because Henry Dundas, a Scottish politician, stopped Wilberforce from abolishing the slave trade for 15 years. 15 years, and I calculated it. During that period, about 630,000 Africans were transported into slavery. Henry Dundas's argument, and I've got the original documents on the table, his argument was, we need the money economically that the Britain could not survive. And therefore, we've got to delay the slave trade abolition and Wilberforce was helpless for 15 years. Now, who was Henry Dundas? He was Scott. There's a 150 foot statue mm. to him in the middle of Edinburgh. And we're now debating what I said to the council and to everybody else. This guy did that to, to black people. This is historical fact. Why isn't it on his, on his, on his yeah. statue? It's not on his plaque. The word slavery is not there. We've managed to get slavery on, his, on a, 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 a temporary plaque at the moment with the council. And the council has asked me to chair a committee to look at the history of Edinburgh and its relationship with slavery. And the Scottish government has asked me to look at museums. And Edinburgh University has just contacted me to do a similar thing in terms of chairing. Now, the point is that that is critical because if we only know half of this history, then the historians or the people that manage this society continue to manipulate the situation. So my view is we've got to know the history well, it's got to be taught properly so that the, the, the person in your video who is making all these comments mm -hmm. will no longer have any justification for making them. They're making them on, you know Wilberforce, you don't know Dundas, you don't have an argument. Right, so education is definitely the Critical. key. Critical. Not just yeah. pulling yeah. down statues in no. the space. No, absolutely. As, as far as statues are concerned, my view is if you remove the evidence, you remove the deed. The okay. next statue down should be racism. Mm -hmm. oh, we like don't that. want any distractions. I, I think that's um, we can use that on on, on t-shirts. The next statue down <laughs> should be racism. Racism. Patricia, do you want to come in, in there before yeah. we uh, sort of bring the Lord Mayor back and start asking the question? Yeah. I mean, I I think I mean there's a a saying that history is written by victors, yeah. and that's been the case. Uh, and so, you know, if we look at uh, re historians actually um, rewrite, people say don't rewrite history, but historians are constantly rewriting history as new information come to light. And also, I mean, now we have, um, we used to just learn about kings and queens. <laughs> now there's a far more docu documentation of other social groups within British society, their histories and so on. Um, and I think, you know, one of the problems why um, people, one of the reasons why people will say that uh, don't, that was a long time ago is because there's never been a recognition that wrong was done. Uh, wrong, that something, a crime, what we call a crime against humanity was committed. And uh, someone in the chat writes, we memorialized the World War II and the Holocaust, but we don't actually. <laughs> so that because we didn't, we don't see um, and the enslavement of black people as, as a criminal act, as a crime, right? Mm -hmm. Then we cannot address, you know, we, we, we don't see any need. <laughs> we can dismiss it. We don't see any, any need 
to actually address it. But as Jeffrey says, the afterlife of slavery continues. It hasn't the dehumanization, the practices that lead many of us to premature death are still very evident. And I think we have to reach a point when there is societal recognition that wrong was done. And there, there is a reluctance. And can I also say quickly, uh, most of my research is on Africa, African countries. I'm interested in violence in Africa. I'm interested in um, resource extraction. And the scale of resource extraction in Africa to Europe, I mean, even countries that are at war, right? the amount of money that is leaving is incredible. And you, you know, you can't, you know, you, you know, I sometimes find it, I can only think about the, the fact that Africans are not still not considered human, why this, these conditions will be tolerated, right? Why the wealth of the continent can continue to leave. <laughs> and then people are given little bits um, in the form of humanitarian acts and mm. aid and so on, which is so small, right? It is, you know, um, the billions that leave in Africa on a sort of yearly basis don't compare, right? So that people are given SOP instead. And I think if, if black people in the West were recognized as humans, as, a, as a equal human beings, then it was possible to change some of those actions. I mean, people are challenged them, even within African countries. They're tied into these trade relations, which are really, you know, subject people to extreme poverty all the time. And unless we address, you know, we're seen as human beings with the needs of other, you know, uh, uh, other same needs as other people defined as human beings, then we're not going to address this problem. And that's why tackling racism is so important. It's the crux of you know, <laughs> um, a lot of global structural issues yeah. that need to be addressed. I agree. Thank you so, thank you so much. And there, we've only just touch the tip of the iceberg here uh, in with regard to the discussion that I'd love to have but um, but I'd like to thank the two professors for sharing their thoughts so far and hopefully we'll be able to get together again and talk about these issues in greater depth but I'd, I'd just like to before we get to the um, the uh, chat in the from the participants here I'd just like to bring the Lord Mayor back in to say a few words right so i've got yeah questions yeah i ju just to pick on some uh, pick up on some of the points that we previously heard really you know um you know does racism steal from us it definitely does you talk to any individuals how to try and function in an inherently racist structure and then you know exactly what it steals from us you know it steals our potential our finances, our opportunities to progress, uh, to remain in steady employment uh, by developing ourselves through, through that structure. Uh, and so when you talk about does racism steal from us, it definitely does. But also on the other point about enslavement and, you know, that also steals from us because I see in the discussion, the narrative around enslavement is historically important, as everybody does. But I also think we have to be mindful and very much aware that it stops us from moving forward. It keeps us entrapped and entrenched in a history, not of our making, uh, one from a colonial perspective, and it, and it stops us from moving forward. Um, the opportunity to talk about enslavement and um, reparation, you know, we, we, you touched on that, uh, Professor Daly. Um, but more importantly, we, what we have to uh, focus on is about our history, about, you know, our contributions to society historically and even now. And, and, and that's the other thing about this eternal debate and discussion about enslavement. It always blocks the opportunity for us to move forward mm -hmm. um, within society and also to uh, ensure that we change society's perception of us. You know, we know about the importance of history, but why aren't we talking about the ancient kingdoms of Kush and the contributions that we made to society, you know, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years? Why are we still talking about a history not of our making uh, and certainly of absolutely no financial gain to us? Um, I think also there's the, the narrative in Liverpool at the moment is about looking at the street names and the statues uh, that come from enslavement. 
nobody talks about the emotional trauma that that created and still creates to this day mm -hmm. uh, and our impacts on us as black people and our daily lives you know walking through streets with constant reminders of how our ancestors were abused raped murdered etc um and so you know it's always spoken about us as though people are socially and um you know removed from the situation mm -hmm. and, and you can't take it out of context and I think the opportunity that we've arrived at um, in terms of COVID um, you know COVID and Black Lives Matters um, you know the, the murder and um, the brutal murder of George um, you know has had an impact because what has happened is we've had a planetary alignment of three crucial things that has been able to put the issue around racism on a global stage where we've been able to just not just passing as we do you know when racism occurs oh that's awful let's move on it's enabled us to unpick racism you know historically and how it impacts on us now and how it will impact in the future and so i think covid has given us the opportunity to tap into our emotional intelligence to look at racism from a different perspective uh, than we have done previously but it has also opened up huge opportunities in terms of how we tackle the culture and psyche that keep racism alive and kicking. All right, thank you so much, Anna, for sharing that. Do, do you know, um, one of the reasons why I um, created the talk is partly because of my, my experience, my brother's experience, my father's experience coming to the UK in the 50s. And because of the mental health pressures mm -hmm that they've all had to bear, we've all had to bear, because we it's quite often, um, as, and that's a term that we, you, we can discuss at a later stage, people of colour, bane, um, coloured, all the different terms have been used for, for us. And we're human beings, first and foremost, as Patricia said, but we're not seen as that, it's often labelled differently. So one of the um, things um, before I get to the chat is that is to think about the mental health impact because even this week, um, I think it was on Twitter, then it went to the independent Yuwande Biala. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard about her. She was talking about people not pronouncing her name properly because that's another microaggression. It's like Bryden in the film. People mm -hmm. say, oh, Brian's easier to say. You know, taking people's names from them, naming, as, as um, Professor Palmer said earlier, is we, we're speaking in English now because that's what we've been brought up to speak because mm -hmm. our ancestors' original languages have been, were taken away. People were mixed so that they couldn't communicate. And then we had to learn English to be able to communicate. So that's why we, where we are now. Okay, before, before um, I don't want to go before we either had a chance to go through some of the points. So I'll just read some of the, um, the notes to the messages. This one's from Patrick. It says the talk has been done to strengthen the character of our black youth as the world is unforgiving when it comes to racism. And this is so vital. The talk is health and safety talk of social life and navigating everyday situations from going to the shop to getting a job. How many times have you said, or have it been said to you, always get a receipt, don't put your hands in your pocket, don't do this, don't do, or look at, is that, you know, <laughs> is it, are you familiar with that kind of behavior with, with your family, with your families? So this is to the panelists. Uh, well, you, you know, I've, that in the sixties, you know, you're walking up the road and the ladies would move their handbags to the other side because they think you're going to rope them. But the, the, the only point I'd like to make before we finish is that people may, you know, if, if, if we keep, keep on putting the, that we are, uh, are, are just the victims who's not got the capacity to fight back, mm. we are fighting. Yeah. We are not just somebody who somebody puts in a corner and robbed from. We're not. And we've then got to learn the history that was missing, learn the lies, transform them, 
and change attitudes. The idea that we're just a whole load of people who people can come along and rob, we're not. Yeah, that's so true. I, I appreciate you know? that. It's a, good, it's a good point. We're, we're not um, as we're, we're labelled chattel as property mm -hmm. with no uh, conscious thought whatsoever. And it's about engaging in conversation. Distinction uh, rebellions. We've got mm -hmm. great people who fought and people are fighting now. And therefore, the idea that, that white people will just see us. There's a whole group of black people. They're always complaining. They're being robbed. and they were, No, we are now going to learn about what we've got to learn. History doesn't change. The, the, the whole facts are still there, it can't be changed. Interpretation, we are going to interpret it now. And we're going to put forward the, the truth of the situation. And our children is gonna to help to change it. We're no longer a group of people who are just sitting there hopeless mm. and people beating us up. That's a really good point. And this is all about discussions and um, conversation. And I've got a, a comment from Shell here. As a white person listening to this, and I'm pro prolifically against racism, I also know I need to keep learning and not just sit with, and not sit with just what I think I know. Your film and this discussion reinforces the importance of doing this. Thank you very much for that, Shell. Um, next comment from Junie James. George Floyd was publicly executed. There is no established political outcry from heads of state, an accepted form of treatment of people of black African heritage globally. Any response to that? Well, yeah. Please. Can I just, can I, can I say something? I'm just picking up on what the Northern Mayor said um, about the emotional trauma. And I think it's really important to recognize that um, we go through emotional trauma. It doesn't mean that we should forget because I'm, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, so I don't really know how to deal with trauma. But I think at some point you have to work, <laughs> you know, you have to aim to resolve, you know, to get over it, to resolve it, to do, you know, you have to work through that process. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I just remind what you said reminded me of, um, I think it was on a Twitter discussion about people, about which black, which films about slavery they can watch, because it's so painful for us to watch them. I mean, you think that people might think those films are made for us, I guess, but they're so painful to watch. Okay? Sometimes I don't even finish them, you know, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and I'm in a position you know, where I might break down. So I have to stop and pause. Or sometimes I just, you know, I thought I need a break from this. I'll come back the next day and watch. And that's what happens. That's the trauma that we still live in, right? Um, and it's not, you know, when we watch these films, they're not entertainment films for us, right? Um, because we, we see, we can still see ourselves in them and we can see the afterlife of that, that experience manifesting in, in, in our daily um, lived experience in these societies. Um, statues, I, 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 I like the fact, Lord May, that you said walking past these things have the same effect because they have for me as well. You know, um, and you've heard a lot about the road statue in Oxford. Yes, walking past roads. You know, my office is opposite uh, Rhodes House. And I have, to walk, I have to walk past that every day, you know, so twice or several times a day. Margin has made it. several oh. times, and it's traumatic, you know. Oh. It's going, uh, and so, um, yeah, it's important. These statues, they can, they can, be, they can move them. They can put them in a museum. We can have discussions about them in a museum. But I don't want them in the space where I, I don't want to have to relive trauma every day, and that's yeah. what happens to me. It, it is traumatic and it also per perpetuates the racism mm -hmm. because it's about two different views of that person. We have our own views as black people and obviously non-black mm -hmm. people have their views of, of that individual. So it also perpetuates a lot mm -hmm. of the uh, things that traumatise us. I think in terms of the point about uh, that was raised from Patrick about our youth and that's, you know, it's at the mm -hmm. forefront of everybody's mind. Um, you know, as adults, we, we've learned coping mechanisms um, to deal with racism, but our, our youth are, are really opened up to the experience mm -hmm. of, you know, and, and, and ill-equipped 
to deal with the fallout of racism, you know, is, is an important issue that we have to recognize. Um, marginalized from society, not being able to meet their full potential. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is all the impacts that racism has on our youth. And so, you know, talking about getting a receipt when you go to the shop and things like that, you know, just having that conversation, the talk mm -hmm. with our youth mm -hmm. is, is damaging, you know, to their mental health and well-being. Um, because right away we're putting our youth, young children, on alert. The fact that we have to do it, we're putting them on alert. But mm -hmm. when they internalise that and start, you know, laying awake at night in bed thinking about how it's going to impact on their lives, that's another form of trauma for our young people. Um, but if you don't have the talk with your young yeah. people, though, then they, yeah. the experience when they yeah. are treated um, and treated differently mm -hmm. to other, uh, their mm -hmm. peers... That is as traumatic as yeah. well. Yeah. It's necessary. It's the talk is so necessary. Yeah. You know, I totally agree. But we right. also Let's... have to look at the flip side of how it impacts yeah, on, absolutely. on our youth right. as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, just a few more comments here. Um, racism is a soci is socially engineered disease, and as Professor Daly states, it's a tool of powers that be to oppress, oppress, and control Black people by direct policy or racially biased interpretation and application of policy and practices. All right, um, that's the, this is from Sarah Bailey. There is something fundamental, fu fundamental about decolonizing education and exploring restorative practice. How would the panelists have us tackle grassroots learning about who we really are nationally and internationally, whilst the white canon exists in how we learn about the world? collective thought is almost impossible to shift. Even if a white person challenges racism and white supremacists, they are ostracized and shouted down. But we've got to, you know, the, the, the thing is, you know, we've got a, a vice president in the United States and she's worked to get there, just like our mayor. The, the point is that we um, can change the narrative but we've got to study it. As, as Langston Hughes, the poet said, if somebody isn't going to do something for you, you do it yourself. And therefore, I agree with what's being said about the race or the statue, whatever, but I, I agree with Langston Hughes. When are we going to say we have started to do it and we're gonna do it ourselves? We're not going to put up with a narrative that we know isn't true and that has enslaved us and, and caused racism. If we don't do that, then we will have Wilberforce still and Dundas no. What I'm advocating, those in power must help us to change the narrative, to change the educational system so it becomes embedded in the curriculum, not because it's nice to do, mm -hmm. but because okay. it is the truth. Yeah. And, and we must do that ourselves. And as far as statues are concerned, my ancestors had to face slave owners. I can face a bit of metal. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, yeah, I think that's a, a crucial point that's been raised around <laughs> education and, and, and challenging mm -hmm. uh, you know, the structures. And that's been one of the most difficult tasks of mm -hmm. my tenure as Lord Mayor with two terms. And I might mm -hmm. add, I need two terms because that's how difficult it is you know, right. having the conversation about race and inequality. But, you know, the issue around um, challenging the structures is, you know, how do we do it? You know, it's like, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. And so we can, as leaders, you know, implement change, small changes that have a massive impact. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know, for an example, this is the year of reading this year. And so I've managed to get two books into schools in Liverpool from black authors. Mm -hmm. One is the Three Little Jamaicans from Patrick Graham, and the other one is about the third live bird, which is about a black child uh, living mm -hmm. in Liverpool. And so you can initiate conversations within education, which is all part of, you know, um, you know, how do we decolonize the education system? We have to start somewhere. And, and, and so, you know, it's about how do we break that cycle? So we can, you know, everybody always starts with, oh, somebody young, you know, infants or somebody, you know, who's coming into employment at 16, 17. Well, you have to have to waste a practical lifetime 
to see the change because that change is driven by that individual's uh, understanding and knowledge of racism. And so I think we have to approach things from, from all areas. I mean, the big mm. issue for me in terms of policy, change in policy, so working with Hope University to implement a black social workers a program, mm. a black teachers program, mm. um, you know, we know this, we did this in the mm. 80s, it was positive action, you know, but, you know, mm. having to do that in terms of implementation to navigate around these structures and policies that block us is the difficult thing because we have to unpick all those policies and we have to convince people to start doing things in a completely different way, in a way that is you know, beneficial to us as black people and not to our de detriment as what we've seen historically. That makes me feel hopeful rather than they're robbing us and we've got our hands mm -hmm. behind our back. Yeah. But, 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 you know, they're both, you know, they're part and parcel. The, the mm -hmm. codependence, we come from a history where things have been stolen from us. It doesn't make us weak. You know, it mm -hmm. makes us strong because we've, mm -hmm. we've got the ability to recognize exactly what's been stolen and how it's impacted on our lives. And we have the ability to bring in the, you know, the effective change that needs to take place. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'd, I'd just like to go round and thank the Lord Mayor and Rodri, uh, Professor Patricia, uh, Patricia Dale and Professor Jeff Palmer for being here as part of this discussion. And I hope that everybody who's attended and watched this is watched this live and who um, will look at it afterwards on the Heart of Glass site will start having conversations and discussions. But I'd also, um, you know, I'd obviously like to thank um, Emily, who's, who's been brilliant through, throughout this. Emily G has is, is been the producer of all this. Um, without the commission, this wouldn't have happened and we wouldn't have had this discussion at all. So thank you for that, Heart of Grass and Emily. I'd like to end with one, one last comment from the participants here. It's from Thomas Dukes. He says, thank you so much, Professor Palmer, for pointing me towards the extent of Kant's racism. I've never realized, nor have I ever directed, nor have I ever been directed towards it during education on Kant's philosophy. Mm. I will change accordingly. And that's all we can ask for, mm. that we've opened up people's minds to look at things differently from the perspective of the people experiencing the racism and as one of the characters in the film said no just don't try to tell me what my experience is listen to me and uh, mm -hmm. if we have a conversation where we can talk people can listen and then we can move towards greater understanding from both sides then that that would be a job well done i think so thank you thank you all very much for being here and i'll hand over to emily to close this out Thank you.